Wake up! <laughs> up you wake, up you wake, up you wake. My name is Cameron Bailey. I'm the artistic director and co-head here at TIFF. Welcome to the 30th anniversary screening of Do the Right Thing. Yes. In the presence of Spike Lee. I am so glad that all of you are here this evening uh, for this hi uh, historic event, really. I don't think it's um, too much to say that. This will be a brand new 4K digital restoration of the film for those who follow that kind of thing. And it'll be followed by uh, a Q&A with Spike himself. Yes. So get your smart questions ready. Before we, we uh, begin, I want to acknowledge where we are tonight. This is the treaty territory of the Mississaugas of the Credit First Nation and the traditional territory of the Haudenosaunee, Anishinaabe, and Huron-Wendat. We're grateful to have the opportunity to work in this community and to support First Nations, Inuit, and Métis communities by showing their works, showing indigenous work here at TIFF. Now, I remember this film. Uh, I remember 1989. Some of you may not have been born in 1989, which is all right. <laughs> 1989, the number, another summer. And it's perfect that it is the hottest night of the year <laughs> that we are screening this movie. I remember another summer 30 years ago when I saw this film as a film critic, probably the only black film critic in the city of Toronto at that time, maybe the country for all I know. Um, and just the electric effect that this movie had on me, where I felt for the first time, and remember, I'm watching this with no other black people in the room, um, so that was an experience. Um, but to see just the brilliance of the technique, the form, the color, the music, the movement, the cutting, the, the cinematography, the performances, just the art of the film uh, operating at such a high level, and then the story, a story of injustice that was taken from that moment, from right now. Imagine that you're living in it because you know what? We are living in it. Uh, it's still going on today and that's something that I hope we can talk about after the film with Spike. But this story is a story that was incredibly charged at the moment in 1989 when it was made and released and there was a lot of controversial reactions to this movie. Uh, people saying there are gonna be riots in the street and whatnot that of course never happened. But the movie has survived, it has thrived, it has become a piece of the legacy of cinema. It is one of the films that is in the Library of Congress. It will be preserved, we hope, forever. For as long as there are movies, people will be watching Do the Right Thing. And we're so thrilled to be able to present it to you tonight in the way it's meant to be seen, on a big screen with other people together. So enjoy the film. Spike will be with you afterwards. Always do the right thing. Still holds up. And it's gonna, to the end of time. It still feels so relevant. I mean, as recently as this week, we've seen news about uh, the Eric Garner case. Right. Um, can you talk a little bit about what went into it at the moment and why you feel like it is still so relevant today? Well, shit hasn't changed. The murder, the murderer's chokehold of Ray Raheem was based upon the real NYPD chokehold of a graffiti artist. His name was Michael Stewart. It was a Union Station, uh, Union Square subway station, and uh, the guy was smaller than me. Cops jumped on him, choked him to death. And you saw also saw at the end of the film, we, uh, we chowed out some other families. Uh, People who've been killed by the NYPD. So many years later, when I saw the NYPD do the same thing to uh, Eric Garner, it was like, this is the same shit. And this past week, the United States Department of Just Us <laughs> cleared the uh, offices of anything. So, and all, it also, they waited to the, lat, the day before 
the statutory thing was going to run out. And uh, the next day was a day, it was a fifth anniversary of this, this murder. It took five years. And as we know, the list is too long to go over of people of color who've been killed by the forces. And, you know, they didn't go to jail. And so, Don't put that much uh, the authorities, you know, on uh, the lives of colored people. When this film came out, there were a lot of a lot of reviews, you know, people on both sides. And the one thing that always got me was when reviewers would talk about lament the loss of Sal's famous pizzeria. And they just put more weight on uh, the loss of white-owned property than a black life. And so that shit has not changed. Mm -hmm. Can you take us back 30 years? You had made, um, she's got to have it, you had made School Days. This was a bigger project than either of those films. Um, clearly, there was a lot that you wanted to accomplish with the film. It feels epic. And can you talk a little bit about just conceiving it at that moment, what story you wanted to tell, just the, the canvas you wanted to paint? And I know that it's, it's rooted in Brooklyn as well, which is the neighborhood you know best. The People's Republic of Brooklyn. <laughs> <laughs> well, I had the title for anything. Hmm. I knew it was going to be called Do the Right Thing, Know What It Was. But then everything just started trickling. I knew I wanted to be in the hottest day of the summer. And it's the hottest day of summer so far here. Yeah. And, and this weekend's going to be 100 degrees in, in New York. Uh, set tomorrow and Sunday. So the heat, but the heat in New York, you know, at the 95 degrees, it's just crazy. <laughs> you know, just all those people living on top of each other. And at the 95 degrees, you know, it just should happen. So I knew that I wanted to be that. And as the, as the day goes on, the temperature goes up and we see uh, things escalate. And I wanted to have uh, the whole film to be shot in one block. Mm -hmm. And four years ago, New York City renamed that street to Do the Right Thing Way. That's right. It's the only street named after the movie in, uh, in the history of the, the city. So it takes place in one day, and you see the many, the, uh, the, the many characters that are living the block. I wanted to talk, I mean, we were talking about, even though it came out in 89, I wrote in 88. So I was talking about gentrification in 1988. Mm -hmm. I was talking about the global warming, you know, talking about mm -hmm. police brutality. So several things we had, uh, the crystal ball, we joked earlier, I did not predict a black president though. I mean, uh, <laughs> Although you were I, talking about but, Donald Trump. <laughs> Yeah, well, I don't call him, I call him uh, Agent Orange. <laughs> and so we just live in a very, very uh, shaky time in the, in the world now with this guy in, in the White House. And I mean, it, it's, it's, it's serious now. And as uh, President Barack, Hussein Obama has said, this coming election can be the most important election in history of the United States of America. It's really about the soul of the, the country. Uh, gotta give a shout out to, again, Night of the Hunter, Robert Mitchum, Love and Hate, that, that was written by James Agee. That's where mm -hmm. the, the style was at that time, knuckle rings. I, because Night of Hunt, I saw it in the film school at NYU. So that's how I got that deal. Of, instead of putting tattoos on uh, Ray Rahim, you have knuckle rings, love and hate. And so that's what that's what the battle is now. And uh, this this guy in the White House, he's on the wrong side of history. We showed that at the end of Black Klansman, where the President of the United States of America, the so-called leader of the free world, refused to repudiate the Klan 
neo Nazis and the alt right said that you know he was, he was couldn't do it for fear of uh, losing his uh, base the same way the same way he didn't tell he keeps saying uh, you know send her back send her back that wasn't me I wasn't saying it <laughs> yeah you know he was egging the motherfuckers on so that's that's where we. Are, and I think that's one of the reasons why this film uh, is still relevant because it, it, the shit that you've seen the film is still going on. It's, it's not a history lesson. It's not a relic. It's still, it's, you could say, it's ripped from the headlines. My editor, Barry Brown, who's cut many of my films, uh, when I saw terrific footage uh, the murder of Ray Raheem. I mean, the murder of uh, Eric Garner. I called Barry. Said we got to cut. We got to do this. So Barry came over to the office and we cut some footage together. We put it on on Facebook where we cut back and forth between the murders mm -hmm. of uh, Eric Garner, real life, and uh, Ray Raheem fictional. But as I said before, the murder. The chokehold murder of Ray Raheem was based upon Michael Stewart. And them, them cops, and they didn't, nothing happened. Those cops who choked to death Michael Stewart. So, uh, and that's where we're at now. This film, when it came out, didn't look like anything else that was on the big screen. It didn't sound like anything else that was on the big screen. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about the form of the film, the colors you're using, the editing style, the camera movement, mm. uh, all of those elements that went into it that, that really made it stand out and that so many other filmmakers have imitated since. Well, the look of the film was not the director. The look of the film is the DP, Ernest Dickerson, the costume designer, Ruth Carter. Ruth Carter. The production designer, Wynn Thomas. So. What did you tell those people about what you wanted from them? So but the director has to get everybody on the same page. So Ernest and I went to film school together. We finished NYU grad film school, class 82. It was Ernest, myself, and Ang Lee. Mm -hmm. We were all in the same class. Mm -hmm. uh, Ruth Carter was a costume designer. She won an Oscar for Black Panther. She had she been nominated before for Amistad and Malcolm X. Wynn Thomas, longtime production designer. He was a production designer. Uh, she used to have it. School day, do the right thing. Most recently, a new film of The Five Bloods. So we sat in a room. I told everyone, we want people to be sweating watching this film. So the red wall where you see the cornerman, that was not the color wall. Wynn painted it that color. Mm. Ernest would put butane uh, things below the lens. Uh, Ruth, no color. Mm -hmm. So all those things contribute to the... To, to the heat, we, it, the film takes place on the hottest day of the summer. Mm -hmm. And also, another key, I give a love shout out to Public Enemy Chuck D, because I've forgotten how many times you hear Fight the Power. <laughs> but I knew that every time you saw Ray Raheem, he's gonna have a, a song, a rap song blast in hip hop. And I wanted an anthem. And so a song that's in the film, much as it is, it has to be great. So I automatically thought of a public enemy. And so what you see in the film was not, was not the first demo. I, they gave, we weren't ready to show the film to them. And so the first attempt wasn't, you know, wasn't what we needed. And we waited and waited. And then when I showed them the film, then they knew exact Chuck knew exactly. So they wrote the did. song from watching the film. Say it again. They wrote the song. Yeah, we, yeah from no, watching well, the film. well, we we screened it for. Them. Mm -hmm. 
so the first time they were really disadvantaged. They, they, they knew, the, they read the script, but it's not the same as seeing it. But when they saw the film, you know, they, they went back to uh, the Izzy Brothers song, Fight the Power, and they, they worked it from there. It's one of the greatest hip hop songs ever, one of the greatest songs ever. So we have you and your movie to thank for inspiring them, I guess. Um, it's and with that that soundtrack with that song, there's just this. It's a film with a lot of noise in it because it's the noise of a big city on the hottest day of the summer. And I want to ask you about the performances because sometimes they're at a real fever pitch as well. And you have this incredible cast: Sam Jackson and uh, the, all uh, these actors. Robbie Reed was uh, my uh, cast and director. Robbie Reed and Ruth Carter were classmates at at mm -hmm. Hampton Institute, mm -hmm. so they, you know, they they. We all grew up together. Yeah. I mean, I'd like to also give a shout out to my father, Bill Lee, who did who did the score. He did, my, he did the scores for my films at NYU. He did the score. She's gonna have this score for uh, School Days and and uh, this film and, and and Mo Better Blues. After that, Terrence Blanchard mm -hmm. took over. But you know, it's thirty years, so people are not here anymore. Mm -hmm. Ruby D, yeah. Ozzy Davis. Ozzie Davis. Robin Harris, Bill Nunn, Bill the late great Bill Nunn, a Morehouse man, uh, one of the other cornermen, Paul Benjamin. He died two days before the, the 30th anniversary of Frank Frank Vincent, the regular Scorsese films. He's the guy who's in the Cadillac, uh, the convertible Cadillac. So uh, you know, people are thirty years is a long time. When you watch the film 30 years later, what pops out at you most? What do you remember? What's the strongest memory for you? I just remember, you know, certain scenes, you know, we were shooting and uh, everybody was, was doing their thing. We knew how important the film is, but of course you, have, you don't know how it's gonna turn out, but we were confident about it and good, good, you know, I see, to turtle all the time. He lives in Brooklyn. You know, we are, so everybody has, has you know, it's a family, you know, it's, it's, we're losing members of the family, but we always have a, on June 3rd, we had a, a, a giant block party on the block party where we, with, on the part, on the block we shot the film and people came through. Rosie was there, mm -hmm. Danny Ello, or John Carlos Esposito. So we always give each other love when uh, we see each other because this, this film you know, is, a, is a bond. I want to open it up in a minute to you and your questions, so please get those um, ready. I, I wanted to just ask um, a little bit more about you know, your, your whole body of work because you've done so many films over the years that have really stuck with audiences and that really give people, a kind of, I think, a kind of a language to talk about what's going on in their lives. Um, this helped a lot of people talk about police violence, about gentrification, about what was going on in cities all across North America, including here in Toronto. Um, do you, is that a conscious kind of thing for you? Is that a responsibility that you see um, something, I mean, a film like Bamboozled has become really uh, more and more important, it seems, and it, there, there's so many of them. Yeah, nobody saw it when it came out. So. <laughs> it's a masterpiece, too. Motherfuckers be slow. I mean, yeah, yeah, two, I mean, if you haven't seen Bamboozled, check it out. They cast the shit later on, on, <laughs> on VHS and shit, you know, late at night. But uh, it, it, here's the thing, though, and uh, I'm, I'm joking, but if you, people, it, it's... It's like that all the time, you know. So there's some great albums that, you know, novels and stuff. People just missed it for whatever reason. Mm -hmm. They missed it when it came out. Mm -hmm. And so Bam Booz was definitely a, a film like that. Uh, 25th Hour, yeah. you know, yeah. that people, you know, slept in that. But once you, you, when you're an artist, you, you write that novel, that play, that album, that film goes out in the universe and that's, you know, that's it, so. But we're doing what I, I'm doing what I wanted to, which was from the very beginning when I decided to be a filmmaker, I wanted to uh, build a body of work. Mm -hmm. And that's what we've done with uh, with documentaries and you know, a whole bunch of stuff. Because mm -hmm. I never felt that, uh, for me, 
whether you do commercials or short films, it's still, it's still storytelling. It's still storytelling. Definitely. Can we turn up the house? I was just going to say, yeah, let's bring up the lights. We have microphones uh, both on the two sides here and also up at the balcony. And uh, if we call on you for a question, please wait until a microphone comes to you. All right, let's, um, let's start right here. Two hands up, but please wait for the microphone. Oh my God. <laughs> I'm absolutely mesmerized right now. Um, hi, Spike. Um, Hello. You're like one of my heroes, and I'm trying so hard not to cry right now. <laughs> Elvis was a, was a hero to Tomorrow's most. Tomorrow's buddy, never met. <laughs> you, you inspired well, welcome him and John Wayne. <laughs> That's a great line. That is a great that line. That was a great line. Um, you inspire me so much, and I just wanted to say thank you for everything you've done. <laughs> And um, you inspire me a lot because I want to do exactly what you're doing, and I'm an aspiring filmmaker. Now you gotta do what you gotta do. <laughs> <laughs> and I want to do film. That's my that's my passion. It runs through me, and I can't see myself doing anything else. Right. Um, my question is to you: is um, to young filmmakers uh, trying to get their stuff out into the world right now? Um, what advice do you have for their beginning and uh, and just getting out into the world? Yeah. You got you gotta you gotta make films. People making feature films on their their phones. You gotta make it and get it seen. Film festival right here, <laughs> my man right here. <laughs> but you cannot underestimate who sees your film. A whole bunch of people. They put their stuff up. I mean these these agencies and. Studios, they have people who the only job is to look at stuff on the internet, you know. So that's definitely a way to to get seen. But you all at the same time you gotta develop your own voice. If you're doing something where you're just imitating something that's, you know, hot or trendy, you know, that's they're looking for original voices. So I think at, at this at this stage, try to develop your voice. All right, let's um, go over here. Uh, yeah, with your hand up, just wait for a microphone. It's uh, actually further up. Yes. Uh, yeah, the one with her hand up, but just about four seats in. I forgot Trump was in. Oh, I forgot Agent Orange is in the one. <laughs> Negro Damas. <laughs> That's right. Everything's in there. Um, hi, Spike. I just wanted to let you know you're one of my favorite directors, so this is really surreal. Um, but I wanted to ask you, in your opinion, why do you think that Hollywood has and continues to fall for racial reconciliation fantasies, such as Driving Miss Daisy and Green Book, while films such Why get a name those two? <laughs> <laughs> While films such as Black Klansmen and, and um, Do the Right Thing exist and tell bigger, more important, and more relevant truths. I know you have something to say. <laughs> Elvis was here. <laughs> it's obvious what the deal is, you know, in 89 with the Oscars and Best Picture with this. So uh, I will say that Cheryl Boone Isaacs, the former president of the Academy Motion Pictures, Academy Motion Picture Arts and Science, African American woman. She's really done a lot to uh, broaden the the membership. I mean, it it was it's way more diverse today than it was back in 1989. And who's watching Dragon's Daisy today? <laughs> Who's watching Green Book? <laughs> <laughs> See, you got me. I was going to talk about them. <laughs> you really, I mean, once you're playing that 
chasing awards you know, it's, it's a dangerous game because you, you can just change your whole shit. So you, know, you just got to keep stepping, keep moving on. All right. Uh, like 30 years is a long motherfucking time. <laughs> shit. <laughs> We're going close to the back. Uh, I think there's a gentleman with his hand up. Look like you're wearing a white shirt. Okay, that's you. Please wait for the microphone. Uh, thank you. Um, Spike, I just wanted to say it was your movies that single-handedly helped me from flunking high school. But uh, I wanted to ask you, what was hey, oh, it? Oh, hold up, hold up, hold up, hold up. <laughs> <laughs> You got you got to explain that for all of us. <laughs> Sorry. Um, well, I saw Malcolm X in a history class. Well, an in high hour school. Of it. Yes. What grade was that? Grade ten. So you you in ninety two? You in the tenth grade? <laughs> <I'm>, uh, <laughs> oh, you saw it afterwards. I mean, uh, I saw an hour of it in class and then rushed to uh, rushed to the library to get the DVD and I watched it at home then. Okay. So, I, and uh, it was uh, from there. I uh, just wrote an essay on it, and it was it saved my whole life. So I wanted to, but I wanted to ask you, um, what was it like getting everyone ready to shoot in such hot weather? On oh, a movie? <laughs> uh, do the right. I mean, it's their job. <laughs> <laughs> the film takes place in the hottest day of the year. It's in the script. We were hydrated. <laughs> All right, that's an easy one. <laughs> There's a question right here. Can we just bring the microphone right over here? And that Johnny Pump water uh, is further good up? too. Right here? Uh, no, 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 sorry. Um, uh, just uh, after the break, right here. This gentleman right here in the jacket, in the white shirt. Right yeah. Oh. Thank you. Hi, Spike. Hello. Uh, 30 years later, outside of Radio Rahim, which character resonates the most with you when you watch it 30 years later? Mookie. <laughs> Mookie. What specifically about Mookie? Mookie's a very complicated character. I mean, he, I mean he's not really good father. He's shucking and jiving, but he has a heart. And when he saw his best friend, Ray Rahim, get choked to death, he threw that garbage can through the window. And in 30 years, not one black person ever asked me, why did Mookie throw the garbage can? <laughs> White people have. But no person of color in 30 has ever asked me, why did Mookie throw the garbage can? Do mm -hmm. It was, it was not to be a diversion. That's a theory that, that white people said to me, you know, they like Mookie because he saves Sal's life. Really? That, that's <laughs> a theory. <laughs> I've Never heard, heard it a lot. <laughs> really? It was diversionary. Mookie was, it was a diversionary tactic. Mm -hmm. So it got, it, Got the That's heat so them. interesting. People would even come up with that, but okay. <laughs> Everyone's got a take. I mean, that's, it's the same people who put more value on white-owned property, a salad and pizzeria, than the life of a, a young black male, Ray Raheem. One thing I found interesting watching Mookie this time, earlier times too, is that he's so all about his money, about getting paid. Even at Gotta the very get paid. end. <laughs> That's right. And, and that decision to go back afterwards and still ask for his money, that was an interesting one. But even with all of that, he still makes what's essentially a moral decision to throw the garbage can. It's not a financial decision. True. And, and Mookie's like the, the, the mediator in, in, the, in the hood. You know, he, he's going trying to keep things cool. He didn't do that well with the, you know, bugging out, <laughs> Smiley and Ray Rahim, but he's like, that's why bugging out told him, like, stay black. Mm -hmm. 
but it's a very, 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 it's, 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 it's complex. I mean, there's so many things there. You have the ages where the young kids are getting on Ozzy and black unemployment, the, the, the corner men just sit on the corner and, and talk. And, uh, and Mel talks about how we need black businesses mm -hmm. and the Koreans. I mean, it was amazing. I mean, the course of three years, every fruit and vegetable stand was in New York City was Korean. Mm -hmm. I'm not hating on it, but you know, like what, what, uh, what, post on what aren't we doing? Mm -hmm. You know, black owned businesses, you know, we need that. So it's even though it, it takes place on one hot summer, it's, it's a whole lot of history in it. And, and even before, if you're hip, if you peeped it, even before you hear Fight the Power, you have Brent Marcellus playing Lift Away, Lift, Lift Away Voice and Sing, which is a Negro national anthem. Mm -hmm. So there's a whole lot of stuff in there. And, and this film is, 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 about the culture, for the culture. It's also the issue of representation of who's on the wall at cells. Yeah. And that it is. That's, that's, thank you for bringing that up. One of the, for, for potential, or filmmakers, writers, playwrights, for drama, you gotta have two, you gotta have people button heads. And it elevates the drama when they're both, what they're saying is right. So let's, 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 let's break this down. Buggins out like, fuck you, Sal. I'm tired of motherfucking Italians. I had another story about it, but on the wall. There no, no, there's not a busload of Italian Americans coming from Bensonhurst, Howard Beach, the bed die, do or die. Not 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 eighty nine. Your livelihood consists of black and Puerto Rican people spending money in your pizzeria. It was Daniel Daniel pronounced it pizzeria. So therefore, don't you think you just it would be respectful to have some black people on the wall? That's a valid point. Yeah. Let's go to bugging out. What's who I just do? Sal or <laughs> Which one I just do? Sal or bugging out? Yeah. I did Sal? Oh, now Sal's like, mm. yo, motherfucker. <laughs> if you want a, a pizzeria, build your own motherfucking pizzeria. Mm -hmm. This is my business, and I could do what I want. Like Hollywood. Yes. So there's the drama. Two people who are, who believe in their beliefs, and they're going head to head. Funny story. So you saw that many prominent Italian Americans on the wall. And no time, I mean, I know Pacino. De Niro, I mean, nobody, nobody said nothing. So I'm getting ready to do bugging, I'm getting ready, excuse me, I'm getting ready to do Jungle Fever and I need three Franks, not three, three Franks and after songs. Hello, hello, young lovers. It was a very good year. And I forget the, the third song. So Tina Sinatra, this is when Frank was alive. You know, she runs, anytime you want, you gotta go through her. So I requested these songs, and Tina called me back and said, my father's mad at you. <laughs> so what I do, Tina? You burn this picture. <laughs> and you ain't getting nothing from him. I said, Tina, what can I do? She said, well, maybe if you write him a letter and apologize. And I love Frank Sinatra, so. I'm, I wrote him a very respectful, like 10 page letter. <laughs> and Tina gave it to Frank. And he let me use the songs for uh, Jungle Fever. But he was, he was not having it. That's fantastic. 
But he I, saw your movie. He saw it do the right thing. <laughs> so that's good. I don't know if he saw it, but he, <laughs> some, somebody told him. But I do know he saw Malcolm X. He has a, he had, you know, he lived in Palm Springs and he had a screen room in his house. And so every weekend they would, he would call the studio and they would send him a print. And uh, she told me, he, he, she, Tina told me that he, he, he loved Malcolm X. That's fantastic. Yeah. Let's go up in the balcony. There's somebody waving their phone. That's a smart move. Uh, <laughs> just wait for the microphone to come all the way to you. Thank you. Um, uh, first of all, Spike, I want to um, I was tell you that I was saddened to hear that Netflix is not picking up. She's got to have it for a third season. And um, I wish you all the best in shopping around. Thank you. I enjoyed it. Um, it's kind of a spoiler alert for the second season. But uh, close your ears if you haven't seen season two. Yeah, so there's a scene where Mars... Nah, if you ain't seen it, you're late anyways. Go ahead. <laughs> Love it. There's a scene where Mars is talking to his mom, who's Rosie Perez. And, um, you know, she tells him the name of, her, of his estranged father. And it's Mookie. So I was just wondering if in the third season you were planning on merging the worlds of Do the Right Thing and She's <laughs> Gotta Have It, and you were intending to star in the third season as Mookie. We shall see what we shall see. <laughs> but we've done this before. Bugging Out reappears at Bugging Out in, in Jungle Fever. And the two cops that murdered Ray Rahim tried to arrest Wesley Snipes in Jungle Fever too. Check it out. So we we've been we we did that a long time ago. Hmm. Yes, uh, one of the the taller of the two policemen is Danny Ello's son. His name is Rick Ello. His his other son, Danny Danny the third was Danny's stunt double, but he, he died of cancer. Okay. All right, we're gonna have to wrap it soon. Let's take just one or two more. Somebody's holding up a pizza box over here, which I like, so you get to ask a question. I hope you got a question as good as your pizza box. Microphone's on its way to you. Hi, Mr. Spike Lee. Hello. Um, First of all, I just want to say thank you so much for your collection. It solidifies the relationship between me and my dad. He raised me on those films, among other films. So thank you for that. Um, it's thank definitely you. given me a lot of perspective. Um, one thing I want to mention is um, I really love your use of music to play with our anxiety with your characters. I think it's absolutely brilliant. Um, when Sam Cooke was playing uh, before Malcolm X's death, as a child, I, I was scared to death. There's something that was boiling within me, and I was like, oh my God, why do I have this feeling? I don't know what's going to happen, but I don't have a good feeling about this. And so if you can invoke that feeling in a four-year-old, I just want to like let you know like you did that. You saw but, Malcolm X when you were four? Yeah. <laughs> I mean, I saw Malcolm X when she was four years old. Uh, well, over and over again too, because you know my dad was really about. And we used to watch basketball and just wait for your courtside reactions. So, um, yeah, man, I'm holding a pizza box. I have the Dodgers. Like, I, I got you. But one thing I wanted to know really is like, when you were writing these films, what were you at that time listening to? or watching, regardless of it either inspiring you, but just what were you kicking back and watching? Um, what was your environment like musically and film-wise? Well, I grew up in a, a jazz household. My father, did, did, as I said before, did all the scores for my films at NYU and then school day, excuse me, she, in, in order, she would have it. School days, he wrote Straight Nappy, you know, Dan. Uh, do I think more better? But my father, 
he was like total jazz. So growing up, you know, if you want with my sisters out, we had to sneak and listen to Motown or the Beatles. He was like, we turn that bad music off. You know? <laughs> so I listen to all, to all types of uh, music and uh, I've used all types of music in, in, in my films. I'm glad you mentioned that. Uh, that's one of my favorite scenes, and uh, I've done the great Sam Cooke singing "A Change Gonna Come" and also I think that's the best use to date of my double dolly shot, which everybody imitates. <laughs> Your signature. Yeah, but people know where. <laughs> people know. <laughs> Quick story. Uh, during the making, the pre-production making of Malcolm X, I got to know very well and close, became close with Dr. Betty Shabazz, Malcolm's widow. And she told me that she felt that her husband, Malcolm X, wanted to be a martyr and knew he was going to be assassinated that day. So she told me that. I mean, that that was like my head was spinning. I said, "How am I gonna? How can I convey to the audience that he knows he's going to his his, his funeral?" And uh, I said, "We got to do the dolly, the double dolly shot." The first time we did double dolly shot was in in, in Mo Better Blues. So Ernest, if we did not invent that. I did not invent that, not the first one you said, but it's become a signature. And so Ernest and I, we got to a point where, you know, we were still, we weren't that far out of film school, so we're like doing just film school sh tricks and shit <laughs> like that. So we came, Ernest and I came to a point saying, we're, we can't use this shot unless it, 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 it's, uh, it works, that it, it moves the story forward. So. I think it worked at the end of uh, Black Klansman. That was good. It worked in uh, Inside Man, that where Clive Owen's character fakes a uh, assassination of a hostage. So what that that was Denzel's his character's mindset, seeing what he thought was a a murder of a of a hostage. So we were very careful where when we. Pull out the double dolly shot. That's what we call it. We're always looking for it, though. We're waiting for it. <laughs> what was what was really hip? Because it never happened before. We had the world premiere of Black Klansman in Cannes, and when that shot came out, people, the audience, roared and started to. You were there. <laughs> you shaking head like you were there though. <laughs> yeah, you're like yeah, that was, yeah, yeah. Was... It never happened before. The entire palais started to cheer mm. and clap at that point. It never happened before. That's fantastic. It's there? like seeing the signatures by Spike Lee. I was there, yes. Tell them. <laughs> <laughs> Tell them about the stand ovation. There man. was a standing ovation. Went on for, I don't know how long, a long time. Um, listen, we're, we're just about out of time. I, I would just ask you to say a little bit about The Five Bloods mm -hmm. that you were just shooting. Yes. My next film, the next Spike Lee joint, is a epic film. It's on the, the if you if you look up epic, you'll see David Lean next to that word. We're talking about that type of film. Lawrence of Ray with Dr. Zhivago, Bridge River Choir's epic. Uh, the morning after the Oscars, I was on a plane to Thailand. Is uh, we shot in Thailand and Ho Chi Minh City, Vietnam. It's a black Vietnam film deals with black Vietnam vets. It's starring Chadwick Boseman, Delroy Lindo, Clark Peters, Isaiah Whitlock, and Norman Lewis, and Jean Renault, the French actor. The story is this. It takes place today. The black soldiers of Vietnam call themselves the Bloods. And four of the Bloods Return to Vietnam today to find the remains of their squad leader, played by Chadwick Boseman. 
the hitch is that his his remains are buried amongst millions of dollars of gold bars. So they're going back today to get his remains and get that gold. <laughs> so uh, uh, it turned out very well. Mm -hmm. When can we see that? Fall of 2020. Okay. I know something that happens in the fall. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Well, All right, ladies and gentlemen, please join me in thanking Spike Lee. Thank you, Toronto. Thank you. Home of the world champions. Toronto Raptors. But you lost somebody. You can't blame them, right? Give love. You got one. And I got your, your GM, Asaya Jiri. That was a risky move. He pulled the trigger, worked out. So, world champions. Yeah. Thank you very much. Thank you. Who? Oh, yeah, yeah, your Canadian brother, RJ Barrett. You don't, you, do you know he's Canadian? You don't act like you don't know it. He He's played a Duke Scarborough, yeah. next to Zion. No love. Ah, uh, you get jaded now. Yeah. <laughs>